माइक हेलो एक्सेलेंसीज डिस्टिंग गेस्ट एंड कॉलीग्स इट इज माई प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू टूडेज लेक्चर ऑन एशियन इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंक बाई श्री बी श्रीनिवास एडिशनल सेक्रेटरी टू द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया आई टेक दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू थैंक ईच वन ऑफ यू फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग आवर इन्विटेशन टू अटेंड टूडेज लेक्चर I would like to brief you about today's program. Today's event will be chaired by Lieutenant General S L Narasimhan, who currently heads Center for Contemporary China Studies. He will make his remarks as chair. Then Sri V S Nivas, today's speaker, will make his presentation, which will be followed by remarks by Professor Amitabh Kundu, distinguished fellow at R I S. after that i am also supposed to make my remarks then there will be a q and a session now i request you all to kindly put your mobile on silent mode or switch off switch it off thank you may i now request lieutenant general sl narsimhan to kindly chair the session and conduct the proceedings thank you sir Ambassador Raghavan, uh, Mr. Srinivas, Professor Kundu, uh, thanks for having me here today to chair this session. This subject is very interesting and contemporary at this point in time. This is one of the institutions that was created rather recently, which many analysts have termed as an alternative to the Brit Bretton Woods system, and they also say that it is a China-led kind of a institution and basically this will create an alternative system but aib has been very popular that is very clear from the way the number of countries have signed up and the way the bank conducts its business and the reason why number of countries joined aib is basically because of the way it conducts its business it's a multilateral development bank It's established by an international treaty, and it is headquartered in Beijing. It was founded to bring countries together to address Asia's infrastructure funding gap. Now, if you look at the studies that have been done till 2030, they say Asia will need 26 trillion dollars worth of investment that is required for improving its infrastructure. And one of the important aspects of AIB is, unlike the other other uh, banks that fund. other programs is basically it is looking at infrastructure <coughs> very clearly and not so much in the develop social development the other banks also do a lot of social development but this is mainly focused on infrastructure development this bank began its operations in january 2016 it has got 97 countries as members at present i travel when i travel abroad with with some of the delegations there are countries which feel that they did a mistake by not joining aib and usa is one of them usa is not joined japan has not joined though japan has got other thing going with aib but there is a feeling that they missed the bus as a initial founding member it has got a mission to improve economic and social development in asia through a focus on sustainable infrastructure cross border connectivity and private capital mobilization projects are supported by a sovereign and non sovereign loans equity participations and guarantees it has got a credit strength of 100 billion dollars with a capital stock of capital stock with 20% assigned to be paid in cap assigned as paid in capital in the shareholding pattern clearly china takes the cake it holds 30.9% of the shares and second comes india with 8.7% of the shares and it goes on further it has got regional members it has got non regional members but the fact remains that everybody seems to have found that aib is a place that we can invest in the aib does not clearly challenge the global governance status quo to be sure its mission rules and governance are a bit different from those of existing multilateral development banks such as the world bank and the asian development bank you know somewhere down the line even asian development bank 
was taking approximately three years to approve a project. And they found the way AIB was working. And AIB was clearing projects within four to six months. And now they have been forced to cut down the approval timing to 18 months, even Asian Development Bank. Basically, it, 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 it dealt this with infrastructure and not poverty reduction or social development. Loans are extended at commercial rates. Recipients' repayment capacity is an important part of the business case for projects. Unlike the One Belt, One Road project, which have come under a lot of questioning whether they'll be able to repay the credit, etc., AIB, when it lends in the process, it also looks into the ability of the borrower to repay this particular loan. Nine out of the 12 directorships are reserved for Asian members. The board of directors and the larger board of governors are non-resident, potentially affording the bank's management more operational freedom than many of the multilateral development banks. China's 26.6% of AIB vote share gives it a veto power, but that is only in exceptional cases. Normally, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually affect the functioning. The AIB, however, is a marginal player within China's fragmented development finance domain. It has also played a minor role in the implementation of the China's flagship One Belt, One Road initiative, although it was ostens ostensibly established to support it. To date, the AIB has loaned just more than 3.5 billion out of 19 billion total paid in capitalization, of which around a third appears to be One Belt, One Road related. It is linked to infrastructure and transnational connectivity. In fact, uh, the, in the number of projects that have been sanctioned so far by the AIB, India is the major beneficiary. India has got a, a eight projects, if I remember correctly, sanctioned from the AIB issue. India is the biggest beneficiary of AIB, with total investment operations of $2.22 billion out of a total of $7.94 billion which have been which have been loaned by AIB so far. Soon enough, AIB is uh, planning to reach the $10 billion loan outflow and thereafter they will continue to grow. The fact of the, the title says Asia, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank changing contours of infrastructure financing in Asia. Is it changing or not changing? I will leave it for Mr. Srinivas to discuss that. At the end of it, after Mr. Kundu, uh, Professor Kundu also gives his comments, then we will take a stock as to whether it is changing the contours of infrastructure financing in Asia or not. With that, I will request Mr. Srinivas to deliver his talk. Ambassador Raghavan, General Narsimhan, Professor Kundu, Deputy Director General ICWA, Ambassador Bhakchi, Joint Secretary ICWA, Srimati Nutan Mahavar, Ambassadors, Senior Colleagues from DRPG, Srimati Sheila Bideji, Sri Sanjay Baruji, Sri Mohan Menonji, Distinguished Research Fellows of ICWA, Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to speak at the Indian Council of World Affairs on a subject that has enthused scholars on multilateralism around the world. China's establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the extent to which the contours of infrastructure financing in Asia have changed thereafter. I'm grateful to Ambassador Raghavan, my mentor, a role model, one whom I've looked up to for the past two decades of my career, for encouraging me to study this subject and present my research findings. I'm also happy to present the research findings in the Indian Council of World Affairs, MEA's foremost organization of academic excellence, an institution for which I feel an immense sense of gratitude and indebtedness for supporting my book research. I was at the Kyoto University and many Japanese scholars expressed interest in understanding the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the impact it could have on infrastructure financing in Asia. On May 7, 2019, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, said that Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has emerged as an important source of financing for priority sector investments. 
Asian trade has been promoted. In fact, the AIB has presented an infrastructure 3.0 of new technologies to facilitate intra-Asian trade. It has supported the concept of transnational infrastructure financing, identifying major growth corridors like the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, which is the CARIC, comprising of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, and the Xinjiang region of China, the Greater Mekong sub-region, comprising of Vietnam, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, and Thailand, and the, sub, and the South Asia sub-regional economic cooperation uh, region, which comprises of Bangladesh, Bhutan, Myanmar, Maldives, Nepal, India, and Sri Lanka, as major engines of growth through road and trade integration. The AIB's view has been that except for Pakistan, Russia, and Turkey, there is a positive outlook and growing demand for infrastructure financing in Asia. Quite clearly, the international interest in the AIB is very high. I do hope that my paper would help address the present gap in research work in India on the new multilateral development bank. I'd like to acknowledge the support and guidance of Dr. D.J. Pandian, the Vice President and the Chief Investment Officer of the AIB, in writing this paper. With this introduction, I will take you down the presentation. The Asian Infrastructure Financing Bank is, is the first multilateral development bank since the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development established in 1991. It currently has 97 member countries. On the day it was inaugurated, 57 members had signed the charter when it was launched in January 2016. And in the last two years, 36 member countries have joined. The pace at which countries are joining is quite um, amazing in that, that countries as diverse as Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Tunisia and Uruguay have joined as members of the AIB. The financing, as General Raghavan has pointed out, General, General Narsimhan has pointed out, is expected to reach 10 billion per annum in the next three years. It's an incredible pace of progress considering that the Asian Development Bank, after almost uh, 60 years, is financing around that amount. The major shareholders are India and China. The United States and Japan are not members of the Asian Infrastructure Bank. The United Kingdom became the first major developed country to join the AIB, followed by Switzerland. India's participation in the AIB represents New Delhi's open approach to the bank and its commitment to multilateralism. It's quite striking that virtually every country in the AIB has quickly accepted China's leading role, and it should also be noted that the AIB uses English as its, as its working language. How, what is the Asian infrastructure scenario? What makes this bank so popular? As you can see, Asia's infrastructure needs are quite huge. 400 million Asians lack access to electricity. 300 million Asians lack access to safe drinking water, and 1.5 billion Asians lack access to sanitation. So when we see the Swachh Bharat program or the uh, Pradhan Mantri Sahaj Bijli Ghar Yojana program becoming major successes, you can see that the huge gaps in infrastructure that exist, not only in India, but across Asia. The AIB has come up with its, with its Infrastructure 3.0 package. In fact, they have come out with a huge document called Asian Infrastructure Financing 2019, identifying every country-wise gaps in infrastructure, how much it would need, what would be the costs of lending, and what would be the costs at which the currency uh, fluctuations and the exchange rates would determine. So it's a comprehensive document that they have formulated and they would like to use new technologies for intra-Asian trade development, integration of Europe-China trade and integration of Central Asia with other regions. The major areas of financing as can be seen is transport sector, information and communication technology and renewable energy. So these are their big priority areas and I'll take you through the major success stories that they've had and one of the big things as I pointed out in my opening remarks was 
transnational infrastructure development is an area where they have been pushing very strong. That is complex sector financing, co-financing with other major organizations and financing across a number of countries at the same time. Some of the big infrastructure projects that have been taken up in recent years in Asia, the Golden Quadrilateral in India, which has had such a major impact on uh, districts which are located 10 kilometers within the highway, and you find that the pace of growth is quite high. The Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, which has enabled transition from agriculture to construction to manufacturing sectors, is another very major success story of infrastructure development. Similarly, we've had the China Expressway, which has not only reduced uh, the commuter time, but has also improved efficiency across the institutions. There is also the railway infrastructure in Central Asia, which has resulted in 0.2 to 0.4 percent increase in GDP in that region. Similarly, there have been, it has been seen that enhancement in shipping infrastructure can uh, and improve the rate of return by almost about 10 percent. Now, what exactly is the gap in financing and the scale of financing that Asia needs? This is the magnitude of financing on infrastructure in terms of roads, in terms of ports, airports, information communication technology, renewable energy that Asia needs. The Asian Development Bank in 2017 came up with a comprehensive report based on a needs assessment of what Asian infrastructure looks like. And they projected that Asia needs an investment of $22.6 trillion. The annual infrastructure financing needs are about $1.7 trillion per annum. Of this, power sector is the single major area which requires $14.7 trillion. The transport sector needs $8.4 trillion. The telecommunications sector, 2.3 trillion. The water and sanitation sector needs about 800 million. The current level of investment, as can be seen, is 881 million. So as can be seen, there is a huge infrastructure financing gap that currently exists. And multilateral development banks do have a major role to play in financing this huge gap. Now, infrastructure financing gap is more than 5% in almost all Asian countries other than China. In some of these uh, low-income countries of Asia, the gap is more than 15%. And merely increasing taxes cannot alone uh, finance this kind of an infrastructure gap. Currently, public sector financing is 92% of the total financing. And the multilateral development banks are financing about 10% of the total infrastructure gap. Let me take you to what this bank is and how it functions. The Articles of Agreement of the Asian Infrastructure Bank envisage that it will be a multilateral financial institution that's focused on infrastructure development. The membership is open to all members of the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. There are two categories of members, the regional members and non-regional members, and then the founding members. We are one of the founding members. In fact, India is a founding member of the Bretton Woods institutions. We are a founding member of the Asian Development Bank, as also the African Development Bank. Our commitment to multilateral cooperation can be seen by the fact that even in pre-independent India, a delegation from India traveled to participate in the Bretton Woods Conference. And uh, Sir Chintaman Deshmukh was the man who led that delegation at that period of time. The governance structure of the bank has a president who is a Chinese individual. Uh, then there are four vice presidents. We have one post, which is the number two position in the bank that is held by Dr. DJ Pandian. And uh, there are technical officers and 12 directors who are representing various countries. The total staff strength of this institution currently is about 200 officials. It's a very thin institution. They have come up with various policies, a financing policy, a procurement policy. I'll take you down each of the sector strategies also. And the financing policy envisages an authorized capital of about $100 billion. The financing is up to 250%, so they can at any point of time have a lending of about $250 billion. So the loans are paid in US dollars, and interest rate is LIBOR. 
And the AIB provides sovereign back financing as also non-sovereign back financing for projects and financing for specific projects as also for specific investment programs and equity investments as also technical assistance. The maturity limit is 20 to 30 years. It is long-term financing. So in case they finance a project, then we can be sure that it should be viable over that period of time. And the repayment schedules are semi-annual. The other big issue is procurement policy. And uh, colleagues who have implemented the Asian Development Pro Bank projects have often found it very difficult to comply. The compliance costs of ADB projects is quite high. Even with World Bank projects, the compliance costs are very high. You prepare a bid document, the bid document goes all the way to Manila, it is approved there, comes back, then you float an international bid, you identify the bidders, once again, the selection of the bidders takes time. The quantum of, uh, of time consumed in complying with the guidelines of the Asian Development Bank is very, very high. And here we have the AIB, which has simplified norms uh, to a great extent, procurement of goods, procurement of works, procurement of non-consulting services and consulting services financed by the bank can all be local procurements. They can be taken up very quickly. And that has led to many projects being completed at a rapid pace. There are no restrictions on the procurement from any country and procurement standards laid down country-wise. And the emphasis, of course, has been given to integrity, ethics, and transparency. So far, we've not had any case of major corruption or major embezzlement coming up through AIB projects, although local procurements have been permitted under this bank. They have developed a series of sector strategies, and uh, there's a strategy for mobilizing private capital for financing infrastructure, credit enhancement, as also gap financing. There's an energy sector strategy which focuses on sustainable energy. There's a transport sector strategy which focuses on viable infrastructure, which is the most commonly used one. Road financing is being seen extensively. There's a sustainable city strategy with focus on urban mobility and a strategy for investing in equity and selective investment in equity funds. Each of these is almost a 250 to 300 page document. So I'll not go into the details of individual sector strategies, but I'll take you through the success stories which they have done. This is a set of approved projects. And uh, as was pointed out, the pace at which this bank is approving projects is quite incredible. You pose a project to the Asian Development Bank, it takes about three years for the project to be approved. Now, this bank is approving projects within a period of six to eight months. And uh, not only is it approving projects within a short duration, the time period of implementation is also much quicker. So, uh, as you would notice, not only India is posing a number of projects, but many of our neighboring countries are posing projects to the AIB. And one interesting observation that I had was when you notice the number of projects posed by Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Myanmar uh, to the AIB, they are far in excess of the number of projects that are being posed to the Asian Development Bank. And that is something that the ADB has taken note of and they have said that the processing time that they would be doing for sanctioning a project would be brought down from three years to 18 months. So that's a big change in infrastructure financing across Asia that's happening. What are the projects that India has approved? We've had uh, power projects, Andhra Pradesh 24-7. There's a Gujarat roads project. There's an Andhra Pradesh urban water supply project. There are also rural roads projects, a Bangalore metro rail project, and a national investment in infrastructure fund. The Bangladesh has approved four projects, which includes a natural gas infrastructure and efficiency improvement project. There is a power system upgrade and, uh, and uh, expansion project. The Sri Lanka-based projects are the Colombo Urban Regeneration Project and the Reduction of Landslide Vulnerability. The Pakistan has, uh, which faces an, uh, a situation of uh, a major macroeconomic shock uh, going for uh, IMF financing, has posed only two projects, which is the National Motorway M4 project and the Tarbela 5 hydropower extension project. Indonesia has had three projects, which includes an urban transport and tourism project, the Mandalika, and uh, Turkey has this huge project called the uh, Turkey-Azerbaijan gas pipeline, the TANAP. I'll uh, detail you subsequently on this. And Egypt has financed a debt financing project called the Solar PV Feed-in Tariffs Program. 
Overall, as can be seen, every country in the region has posed a project and has received an approval. And these are the projects in pipeline. Not only are there a huge number of sanctioned projects that for a bank with just three years experience, it also has a number of projects in pipeline to scale up its financing very rapidly. So as can be seen, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Uzbekistan, Georgia, everybody is posing projects and lining up to the AIB. And we have Mr. Haldia here today. Sir, you would be the most knowledgeable one on identifying the infrastructure financing gap and the kind of pace with which project sanctions can make to uh, building this infrastructure gap, this huge structural financing gap that we witness. Let me take you through the major success stories. We have the TANAP, the Turkey Trans-Anatolian Gas Pipeline Project. And as I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, one big thing, one big constant feature that we notice about AIB projects is transnational financing of complex projects. And the TANAP is one that runs through, it starts with Azerbaijan, runs through Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, and ends all the way in Italy. So they have financed this project partially, 600 million out of the $8 billion. It transports natural gas from Azerbaijan to Turkey and then to Southern Europe. It enhances energy security for Turkey and Europe, and it's a case of co-financing. There are many donors on it, but the AIB could interact with a multiple set of countries and identify this particular financing package. And the pace of construction broke several records. And the international ceremony for inauguration of the TANAP was held on June 12, 2018, which was uh, jointly done by the President of Turkey and the President of Azerbaijan. Another major success story that we witness is Bangladesh, the distribution system upgrade and expansion project, which enhances distribution capacity. It increases the number of rural and urban consumers in Bangladesh. The loan sanctioned is about 165 million, and the disbursement till date is 91 million. And so far, they have 25 lakhs, or 2.5 million service connections have been installed, bringing power to the doorsteps of thousands of households. And construction works for substations and underground cables are going on. Once again, this project was also financed and almost completed within a two-year period. Then you have uh, Egypt's uh, solar PV feed-in tariff program, the AIB approved loan is about 210 million. It was debt for refinancing to 11 solar power projects and co-financed with the EBRD. And uh, the reconstruction and development was 116 million and it seeks to move Egypt to an environmentally sustainable energy mix. And this refinancing was done within a period of six months. So the rapid pace at which project implementation is there is manifest in a number of success stories. However, there are areas where projects have not commenced. And let me take you to three or four projects where Years have passed since the project sanction, but the project has not commenced. And those, uh, the first one is the Regional Infrastructure Development Project of uh, Indonesia, which was sanctioned as financial intermediary to subnational governments. And projects where the AIB is sanctioned to subnational governments, not to national governments, there they're having problems. And uh, this project particularly seeks emphasis on urban water supply, urban transport, sanitation and drainage, flood and hazard risks, slum upgrading. 100 million has been sanctioned, but the disbursements have yet to commence. Then you have the Tarbela 5 project, which is a Pakistan-based project. $300 million have been sanctioned, but there have been delays in selection of the consultants and also in the procurement process, and no disbursements have commenced. Then you have Turkey, which is a gas storage and expansion project. This is a long duration project, six years with $600 billion. And the disbursement so far is only 1.5 million. So the bidding is still going on. Uh, particularly, you notice that projects in Turkey and Pakistan, there is real stress of implementing it on a timely basis because the countries face an exchange rate risk and also are in the midst of a macroeconomic shock. 
The status of India-based projects is most satisfactory, the Gujarat Rural Roads Project, which provides all-weather roads to 4,000 villages in Gujarat's 33 districts. The loan sanctions are on track, and also the overall project progress is on schedule, and 65% of the works have been completed. Then you have the Andhra Pradesh 24-7 uh, Power for All, and once again here, uh, the loan sanctioned is about 160 million, and uh, the loan disbursed is so far 16 million, but procurement activities are still at an advanced stage. And I think because once the elections are completed, then the construction activities would be taken up. Then you have the Madhya Pradesh Rural Road Connectivity Project, which involves construction of gravel roads across all districts of Madhya Pradesh, and the loan sanctioned is $140 million, and the loan disbursed is $23 million. As you can see, the India-based projects are not transnational in nature. They're very much uh, within India, sub-national government projects. There is one more project for private sector investment, and that is the National Investment in Infrastructure Fund. The objective is to mobilize more private sector capital into infrastructure sector and increase the infrastructure investment in India. And AIB is financing about $100 million of the $500 million uh, total financing. How does the AIB compare with the World Bank the, and the Asian Development Bank? And uh, there is tremendous concern in the Japanese that the Asian Development Bank's preeminent role as a development financing institution may come down. And uh, there is also concern in the World Bank that the AIB is financing countries without looking at debt sustainability frameworks. Now, a broad comparison indicates that the World Bank created in 1946, ADB 1966, and AIB 2015. The World Bank has 188 member countries, ADB 67 member countries, and AIB currently has 97 countries. The financing per annum, the World Bank is at $25 billion. The ADB is projected to rise to $20 billion in about three years. And the AIB, the pace at which it is going, it's projected to rise to $10 billion in another three years' time. How, do, how does the future look for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? And uh, we can say that China and India have worked hard to make the AIB successful. And the AIB has moved with considerable nimbleness and speed. And there's also a large shelf of co-financed projects, and it's gaining great acceptability from the international community. There are also success stories being witnessed over a short period of time, and multilateral development banks will continue to play a, a, a major role in infrastructure financing in the coming years, too. There are two developments in the last three, four days that have come in. One is after the BRI summit, it was noticed that several borrowing countries did not have the, although funding was available from uh, major institutions, they did not have the capacity to make repayments. The country's economic viability was not such where they could absorb it. And so China has now announced a debt sustainability framework for evaluating the sustainability of projects, and the IMF and the World Bank have offered technical assistance from their debt management trust fund. So. All in all, one can say that the AIB offers solutions to Asia's infrastructure financing challenges, new constructions, new jobs, new opportunities, and ultimately, the ability to achieve economic security. It represents an exciting new international initiative which needs to be welcomed. Thank you. Professor Kundu to give his comments, please. <coughs> Lieutenant General Nasimam, Mr. Srinivas, dignitaries on and around the dais. I must tell you that I enjoyed reading every paragraph of the paper of Sri Srinivas and very impressive presentation that we have had. Uh, Sanjeev, if you allow me, I would just add one more sentence to introduce myself. I was a teacher and student at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, been dean and 
spent about 40 years. And uh, besides all the things that JNU has achieved, which are well known and debated in the media, I just want to add one important achievement which not, none of you may know. I'm at the Research and Information System, which is an independent think tank under the Ministry of External Affairs. And we were given the responsibility of academic activities for the AIIB's annual meeting, which was held in Mumbai. As I was sitting in the front row, one young man from the dais, who was part of the AIIB team, walks up to me and pays his respects. I looked at him, I said, Somnath, he's one of the very senior officials in AIIB. And uh, well, uh, I was very happy that AIIB does take Indians at a high level. And uh, we had a very nice time discussing JNU and also his experience with the international financing agencies, about which they have been discussing critically during their student days. Uh, I must tell you that this presentation is very rich in terms of the project details. I thought I just flag a few issues, which we tried to do in the annual meeting, which was held in Mumbai, and Honorable Prime Minister was also present there. We shared some of these general concerns and our anticipations and some apprehensions with regard to the funding of AIIB coming. 21st century belongs to Asia. 21st century belongs to India. This is not a statement made by any politician in the heat of the election. These are the statements almost coming straight from the ADB's report, Asia 2030, Asia 2050 shows that Indian share in the total GDP, Asian share, which was as low as 12% of the world GDP in 1961, has gone up and is going to be, by 2030, something like 52% of the global GDP, which is a significant improvement. And India, since it's a faster among the other Asian countries, its share is going to rise even faster than others. Now, this ADB's calculation is based on a general equilibrium model. And the most critical assumption in the model is that infrastructural funding, there will be no deficit. And that was a critical point. If you look at the data for the last 20 years, you do find that our expectations, Asian expectations, had not been belied. Take 2007 as 100, you find that the investment in Europe if 2007 is 100, currently it is 90. It's really gone down. For the United States of America, it has gone up from 100 to 105. For Asia, it has gone up to 150. That's certainly a significant achievement. But I must tell you that still the deficits in the infrastructure and investment, as Mr. Srinivasan has rightly pointed out, there are various social and economic sectors where infrastructural investment needs to be made. And these deficits are something like 10% of the total uh, investment which is being made. And if you take the SDG implications, it will be something like 17%. That was the deficit. Now, there's another problem which India is facing, which the director of NIPP was also hinting at. And Danny Roderick, of the Harvard School has mentioned the premature deindustrialization. India has been able to avoid that. Even China, in the last 12 years, you find the share of manufacturing has declined. And one of the reasons is the infra lack of infrastructural investment. Take the middle income countries, even there, the share of manufacturing in the total GDP has gone down. At the world level, it, if it goes down, we are not worried because they are developed countries, their manufacturing base is high. But if, in case of India, up to 2000, you know, 11, 12, we were still able to maintain our GDP share going up. But now, this has also started coming up. And as I said, an IPAP director did talk about middle income trap coming in. And we certainly think that deficiency in infrastructural investment can push us into this trap. We have to be worried about it. And that's what we are expecting with the new financial institutional financing arrangement, which has come up with the new development bank, BRICS Bank, and of course, AIIB. AIIB share 
in this increase in the investment over this period from 2007 to 2017 <coughs> is not very high, as Srivasanji pointed out. But nonetheless, the expectations are there. <coughs> and certainly, India is looking forward to participating in it. Our share in the total reserve fund is less, but our share in the total loans are much higher than that. That's a very, very positive point. I just thought I'll flag four or five issues, and then we can have the discussion taken forward. The first point, besides, as I said, inadequacy of infrastructural investment, which may come in the way of India realizing the predicted uh, level of ADB, says India's share is going to rise up significantly. 21st century belongs to India. If investments do not come up, there are problems of premature deindustrialization. So that is the quantum of investment. But more than that, public sector investment has been very high. The private sector investment has not come up. Would AIIB be in a position to create some kind of an environment wherein the private sector can come in? Some of the key areas where if AIIB investment comes up, then certainly it should be possible to increase that. But generally, it's expected that private sector should come in in the infrastructural sector to the extent of 50% plus, 50 to 60%. That is one area of concern. And how AIIB can, you know, it's coming up with technology. It's also coming up with, you know, matching the gap between demand and supply. In fact, when we had discussion with the AIIB officials, they did mention that India has a huge demand for infrastructure. And there is supply also available. But there's a dearth of bankable projects. So can we just prepare the bankable projects? And that is one area where Ministry of Finance was also concerned about it. And also, our institute also tried to do a little bit. But that certainly is an area of concern that should we be in a position to have adequate bankable projects so that the gap between demand and supply can be matched. As for the sectoral demands are concerned, the scenario is very clear. India, for the uh, because of the commitment to SDGs, we require investment in renewable energy. We require investment in transport. Regional imbalances is a major issue. Uh, well, happily, AIIB's priorities are these sectors, energy and transport. Although during the course of eight seminars that we organized leading to that annual event in Mumbai, there was some difference in the perspective which came up. Our thrust was connectivity within the country, within the region, whereas their emphasis was connecting, opening up India to the outside world, particularly from the eastern side. But I thought after discussion with the official that this is not a major area of concern. This can certainly be sorted out uh, because sovereign guarantee is an issue. And I think that aspect would be maintained in the context of the infrastructural investment. On the regional dimension, I was looking at the potential in, uh, index for state investment constructed by NCAER. That places certain states at a very low level of potential. And there, there you find investments are not coming up. And the states are not very difficult to guess. It is at the bottom you have Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Assam. Assam, in a way, representing the Northeast. Unfortunately, West Bengal also figures there as a state with a serious concern as far as the investment uh, in the last 10 to 15 years investment deficit. And also, the potential index uh, calculated by NCR places West Bengal at a low level. The question was, which we asked AIIB, that would it be possible to take up the regional priorities, the relatively backward areas where the risk factor could be slightly higher, and northeast. In fact, when we organized a meeting in Guwahati, people from Manipur, Meghalaya, the secretaries had come and they said, sorry, we are not able to get much funding from the international organizations, neither from ADB nor from the 
BRICS Bank, what about AIIB? Well, he said that North is not, is not considered to be perhaps, you know, great center for attraction of the international financing agencies, but the answer that was given by the AIIB officials that if it is a bankable project, politics should not come in between, and if bankability is most important, and well, let's see that whether that is carried into the actual decisions. Now, India needs greenfield investment. Again, greenfield investments are slightly more risky than the brownfield investment. At the moment, AIIB is also co-financing with the ADB and the World Bank, which is in a way safer. But our need in the future years is going to be certainly the greenfield investment. And maintenance and upgrading of the infrastructure would be another area of concern. And that's where pricing becomes very difficult. And as Mr. Sinavas was mentioning, that recovery of the cost and payment is extremely important. So uh, if we are putting in money for maintenance and you know, upgrading of the infrastructure, whether pricing would be done in a way that the repayment <coughs> takes place as per schedule. Uh, as I said, sovereign guarantee has been an important bottleneck uh, but uh, as far as AIB is concerned, Mr. Srinivasan rightly pointed out that it's in a dollar term, which means that the exchange rate fluctuations will have to be taken care of by the national government. That is an area, perhaps, that could be some discussion on this. And, well, I would like to, uh, you know, just mention that the critical areas of concern and certain kind of uncertainties that exist in certain regions. Uh, we thought that the great promise that has come up with AIIB being in the horizon, they should be in a position to address these critical areas of concern. I'm not worried about sectoral priorities. That's where we are very much in agreement. But there are other regional deprivational issues. Cost, maintenance, and upgrading of infrastructure is an area. And also the greenfield investment. Uh, uh, my discussion with them. Uh, certainly sh sh told me that there are possibilities that these differences may not really withhold us in going forward in a big way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Kundu, for those incisive remarks. May I request Dr. Sanjeev to give his remarks, please. Thank you, Chair. As a discussant, I would like to say that today's speaker, Sri V. Srinivas, has presented a well-researched, up-to-date, and comprehensive paper on the contours of AIB's infrastructure financing in Asia. I warmly congratulate him for his presentation. Knowing that AIIB has completed just three years of its op operation, such a detailed study will add much needed substance to the existing literature or I will say the emerging Indian discourse on AIIB. Sri V. Srinivas' study begins with the formation of AIIB and subsequently it focuses on the issue of infrastructure financing by the institution till date. I would like to contextualize the establishment of AIIB or what are the factors which contributed in the establishment of AIIB, China-led AIIB. Here four factors can be mentioned. First, lessons from history. Second, the economic rationale or what some Chinese experts say, uh, testing Chinese ideas. Third, the multilateral motive. Fourth, the geopolitical factor. And in the end, I will briefly talk about India and AIIB. Now, first, the lessons from history. Uh, some Chinese experts, especially from the law school of Beijing Foreign Studies University, stress that the Chinese pivot to multilateralism is essentially because of lessons from history. Multilateralism considered a key for those global institutions that were successful 
while lack of multilateralism doomed the fate of those failures. Uh, let me elaborate this. Uh, uh, we all agree that the first and perhaps the most important multilateral effort in the international economy after the World War II was the creation of Bretton Woods system. The post-war international institution designing was in the hands of two world powers, UK and the USA. Both powers were eager to take the lead in creating the economic architecture. The UK negotiating team was led by John M. Keynes, one of the greatest economists of 21st century, while the US team was led by their chief negotiator, Mr. Harry D. White. The UK favored bilateral approach over multilateralism. Ultimately, USA perspective was adopted, which later proved to be a successful approach. The examples are IMF and the World Bank. Chinese scholars acknowledge that this case demonstrates the success of multilateralism in global financial mechanism. While learning from this experience, it is also evident that Chinese thinking is quite similar to that of American thinking while establishing the AIIB. But it is not so simple. Uh, later part of my presentation will explain this. Now I come to the second part of my presentation briefly on the economic rationale. It is important to note that AIIB meets the needs, need of China's domestic economic reforms. Infrastructure building provides solid ground for China's success in the reform and opening up era. AI, AIIB preference for infrastructure construction is in line with China's reforms as well as its aid and investment policy. Uh, let me here talk briefly about China's going out uh, initiative. China's going out initiative include building of infrastructure, including highway and railway in different countries. To some extent, this contributes to, the, to finding a way out for China's industrial overcapacity. In this sense, AIIB initiative shows Chinese approach to multilateral institutions for facilitating its going out strategy. <clears throat> uh, the speaker today very rightly talked about the gap in infrastructure financing, which has been realized both by China as well as India. Uh, the, role of, uh, the role of private sector investment has also become very important, as it was mentioned by Professor Amitabh Kundu. Uh, it, it has become very important for second phase of China's going out strategy. It is a focus area, and also for the AIIB. But the point here is, in any case, AIIB projects provide opportunities to Chinese firms for overseas infrastructure building, which is China's USP. Uh, now I come to uh, the bilateral arrangements which China has uh, with different countries. If we analyze China's overseas investment, we find that bilateral development loans and infrastructure projects coordinated on a state-to-state -state basis still play a significant role. China has created several standalone investment mechanisms that have a combined target fund size of almost US billion hundred, such as uh, the $40 billion Silk Road Fund, the $10 billion China-Africa Development Fund, and the $15 billion China-Russia Regional Development Investment Fund, among others. However, it is noteworthy that Chinese discourse on AIIB also suggests that China wishes to test its new ideas, which has already emerged from its experience. An expert from Shanghai Institute of International Studies said, and I quote, AIIB has a lot of space for China to test its new ideas. Sooner or later, new models and paradigms that are more suitable to the regional countries will be implemented, unquote. This suggests that the debate is not settled as far as China's approach to bilateral arrangement and AIIB is concerned. We are aware that AIIB's vision and that is lean, clean, and green, serves as the main principles for the bank. And these principles have emerged from the Chinese development experience. It may be noted that the latter two principles, I mean clean and green, they are the main thrust areas of China's 13th five-year plan. Uh, now I come to uh, 
uh, the third section, which is multilateral motive. China uses two parallel means toward global economic governance. What is known in China as walk with two legs. One is to jointly establish international institutions like AIIB. The other is to push the reform in traditional international organizations such as IMF and World Bank. It is also true that by creating the AIIB, Beijing is attempting to avail many of the advantages a multilateral development bank provides to an international investor. The AIIB can help enhance China's influence in modifying the world economic and financial rules. Now, now I come to final section on geopolitical factor. I, I, I discuss, I'm going to discuss this primarily because during the opening ceremony of AIIB in January 2016, President Xi Jinping expressed hope that the ba bank will be a new platform to help foster a community of common destiny. In other words, Xi Jinping's statement highlights the geopolitical rationale as far as AIIB is concerned. Xi Jinping's notion of community of common destiny has become perhaps the most often repeated concept in major speeches by Chinese officials, leadership, and even scholars. However, many ambiguities exist both in concept as well as its application as far as the concept of common destiny is concerned. The principle of equality and respect is not uniformly applied in Chinese foreign policy. A white paper on China's policies on Asia-Pacific security cooperation issued in January 2017 notes, and I quote, a small and medium-sized country need not and should not take sides among big countries, unquote. This contradicts the idea of respect and equality or sovereign equality that Xi Jinping placed at the center of the concept of community of common destiny. In sum, the combination of the Chinese dream, the community of common destiny, AIIB, and BRI have spelled out an alternative geopolitical, geoeconomic, and ideational framework for China. We need to critically examine Chinese actions with regard to these principles. Finally, about India and AIIB, principles such as transparency, accountability, concern for environment, consultative mechanism prior to the establishment of an international institutions, all these factors differentiate AIIB from other Chinese initiatives such as Belt and Road Initiative. And therefore, India chose to be a founder member of AIIB. Today's speaker, as well as the chair, rightly highlighted that in, in, in the last three years of operation, India has been the largest beneficiary with nine projects. However, some experts argue that when two political heavyweights from Asia are members of AIIB, they might compete for influence within the organization, and it may lead to geopolitical con contestations. In such circumstances, consensus building within the institutions could be difficult. If it happens, India should be prepared to deal with the fallouts on ongoing and future projects. On the other hand, there are evidences that multilateral organizations provide India and China a relatively natural, back, natural playground in which the two countries have gradually began to accept their a stronger commonality of interest within a multilateral setting. <clears throat> this understanding at the multilateral level is expected to have positive impact on the nature of their complicated bilateral relations as well. Ladies and gentlemen, with this note, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot for those uh, remarks, Dr. Sanjeev. I'll reserve my remarks to the end, and let me open up the floor for the question and answer session now, so that we have adequate time to cater for the questions that come up. One and two, I can see it here. Third one there. I'll come to you, sir. Ambassador uh, Vishnu Prakash. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Sindhuas, compliments. compliments for an excellent presentation. As I sat there, I have two questions, one legit and one slightly unfair, uh, but let me pose both. First of all, when you were making the presentation on AIAB, I was sitting there and wondering whether it is a panacea 
that the world panacea that the world has found eventually or is it is there something still left that you would want to see eiab do which it has not been doing so far that's one secondly uh and that's the unfair part i mean if not if you don't like to and you may not because i'll invite you to speculate a little why is it that bri and uh, aiib's procedures uh, are as similar as chalk and cheese the bri can, you know is completely uh, non transparent predatory and etc etc whereas as you have explained aiib is quite different so do you think that it will have a rub off effect or their kind of objective thrusts are different do you, thank you yeah we'll take two three questions together and then i'll come to you sir your question sir i will not be as elaborate as my dear colleague has been uh, very pin pointed uh, one is when one is very technical uh, technical i noticed that the lending of the bank is expected to be 10% of the capitalization isn't it a bit too high uh, as a financial expert maybe uh, i would like to know that uh, number one number two questions really on the lending pattern of the bank uh, going ahead from what uh, vishnu said do the do do the bri projects qualify for lending from aiib they do they do, they do. and i noticed that there are quite there are some projects which actually are part of bri for the for this thing and knowing that we have difficulty with the bri how does that actually pan out at the discussions in the aib number 1 number 2 <laughs> number 2 sorry <laughs> what happens uh, when a uh, country's approach aib projects located in politically difficult areas and you know what i mean about, about the politically difficult areas yes yes, yes. all right uh, i will not elaborate over there really? lastly uh, i thought it was we, one question no just, just <laughs> this is very big uh, can india and japan approach aib together for projects in afro asia corridor in asia africa corridor oh. yes i'll respond when and they had a question yeah yeah will will we'll, we'll, One, two, uh, Captain Sidhu first, and then Mr. Mohan Menon. Yeah, we'll take yeah, we'll take, take, second we'll take the second block. Well, There's enough time. Congratulations to the author to bring this topic to us. But I was wondering why was the necessity to create this bank? Anybody who gives money has purpose behind it. Even you see in every day's life. So, what do you think? What could be the objective of China to create this? The second thing is. Well, dispute resolution procedure. What is the dispute resolution procedure? This dispute about the rights. It says third is whether shipping and ports are included in the disbursement procedures. Good. Thank you. Should I take up? Yeah, please, 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 shipping please and ports. do this thing. I'll respond to the three questions raised, and then we'll take another set of uh, three questions. <laughs> Ambassador Vishnu Prakash's question is quite fascinating, in that that is AIB a panacea to the world's uh, infrastructure uh, uh, financing needs. And uh, the first time you look at this paper, sir, you think that oh, there is a global Santa Claus that has arrived on the scene, and financing is so quick. Six months you get financing, and projects are implemented in two years' time. There is no concessional financing either available. It's like, uh, of course, every country would like to go and pose a project to such a bank where uh, approvals are very quick. They're not. Uh, Uh, making you run around uh, like the ADB did three years, you would keep shuttling between Manila and Delhi and <laughs> keep on submitting responses, and then get. Uh, by the time you the project was sanctioned, somebody else would be in your place. So, so here was some project where you could actually see conclusion in your tenure. So it was very attractive. That said, that said. Uh, Uh, the AIB seems to have capped some kind of an upper limit on their financing, and uh, $10 billion dollars is what they're looking at uh, by 2022. And uh, how does AIB financing compare with uh, 
say the World Bank financing or the Asian Development Bank financing. And you'll find that it is procedurally simple. Pro countries are queuing up. They're also looking at transnational trade. So that is one area where there is a difference. They're looking at financing multiple countries together. You're right in pointing out that the uh, BRI and AIIB are chalk and cheese. They're not similar at all. The BRI mandates that there would be Chinese companies going in to take up works. And uh, as you have seen in the case of Hammantota, the uh, Chinese companies have taken over virtually operationalization of the project. Today they're running more than uh, uh, 76 ports of, uh, in the, in the, under the project. And they're also financing countries where economic viability is not so much in debt sustained. That's why there has been this grave concerns about the sustainability of debt through the BRI network. So the AIB is slightly more cautious in that uh, uh, at this point of time. And uh, I suppose I've covered both questions, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, the BRI project, as I would see it, is, uh, is a one-party state trying to acquire a presence in a world order, while the AIB is an initiative which is a multilateral initiative where liberalism is being enforced upon the uh, largest shareholder. So China would have to play by the global rules of lending in terms of uh, contract management, dispute resolution, procurement policies, lending rates, various things. So they cannot uh, uh, muscle their way through the AIB the same way in which they can do it through the BRI. So there is a huge difference in terms of how uh, multilateral lending particularly there is the United Kingdom is a member, Switzerland is a member, so many uh, developed countries are members that it's not easy to handle AIB financed projects in the same manner in which BRI financed projects can do. Uh, the second question, sir, uh, in terms of uh, the questions on the lending patterns and do BRI projects qualify? Yes, BRI projects do qualify, but India and Japan are unlikely to pose a joint project to the AIB. The Japanese uh, Prime Minister's criticism of the AIB is very, very striking. In fact, uh, one of the uh, great concerns that Japan has in terms of their professors talking about it, the bureaucrats are talking about it, is the Japanese hegemony of infrastructure financing in Asia being taken over by the Chinese uh, getting into infrastructure financing. And uh, as you can see, it has mandated uh, Shinzo Abe to announce another $100 billion of infrastructure financing commitments to the AIB. The, to, sorry, to the ADB, and the ADB cutting on its processing time from 36 months to 18 months, and they're looking at even cutting it down further to 12 months. So uh, the, I discussed with a friend who was working on the RUIDP project in Rajasthan as to how they look at it in terms of their phase four project. He said, oh, the ADB is quite quick to look at projects now. They're not delaying it too much. and. Uh, in terms of scaling up their financing also now, Shinzo Abe has made commitments. But he has called, uh, he's been very uh, harsh on uh, the AIB. He feels that it is a bad bank lending to uh, countries which are in debt distress and this kind of borrowing should not be encouraged. That has been the Japanese view. As far as politically difficult areas are concerned, my view is India has uh, an 8% eight, eight share on the bank. and. Uh, most of these decisions, lending decisions, are all voted decisions. And it is very unlikely that a case is brought to the board uh, when a founding member has an objection. And in my many years in the International Monetary Fund, I had seen that if one of the founding members had an objection, the case was not brought to the board till such time consensus was built. Most of the decisions of the AIB are consensus driven. There are hardly any voted decisions. So it is very unlikely that politically contentious issues are financed through the AIB network. I think they would be financed through the other big funds that are there, be it the BRI or you have the China-Africa Development Fund and a huge amount of financing uh, commitments are being made. Uh, there was the issue with regard to whether shipping is being covered. Yes, uh, yes, sir. This question about the BRI, uh, my question really is about the financing of the BRI. Because you know that 
there is a tendency to the BRI projects, but there are times that the profit sheets that are difficult. There is hardly any transparency in the BRI projects. When those discussions take place on the BRI projects, and we know the difficulties which come up, how do the discussions and how does the lending pan out? Ah, the BRI financing. Yes. The BRI financing, sir, is also, of course, there has to be country ownership in BRI financing also. It is not that uh, China enters a sovereign nation and starts executing projects. But uh, there seems to be more attractiveness in terms of BRI financing with regard to uh, those areas where bilateral free trade agreements exist. So, for example, China is funding the Bright Road in Kazakhstan. So, uh, huge road networks across Central Asia are being built using the BRI allocations. And uh, one thing that is striking is that bilateral free trade agreements are being collapsed into multilateral free trade agreements. And I pointed out three major zones where they are interested in. One is the Greater Mekong region, one is the uh, Central Asia region, and one is the South Asia region where massive road construction is going on. And uh, I do remember uh, as part of the EAM office when we built the road from Tamu to Kalimio, and uh, it was very exciting that Thailand, India, and uh, Myanmar came together to build this road. So, it, and that kind of uh, financing across nations through the uh, BRI is happening right now, sir. And the scale at which BRI is being financed is seven to eight times what uh, AIB yeah, is financing. Uh, there is the issue of dispute resolution procedure. The dispute resolution procedure under the Articles of Agreement is quite well laid out and uh, they would be subject to local laws. Unlike uh, the World Bank or the uh, ADB where uh, the Japanese courts would adjudicate or the international co law would be applicable, in the case of the AIB, the local law of the land would be applicable. So it is much easier to resolve disputes. That's why their projects are getting completed uh, more rapidly. Shipping and ports. Uh, yes, sir. Shipping and ports. Yes, shipping and ports is very much part of their uh, infrastructure 3.0. In fact, I will read out, I was looking at the same point. Uh, in terms of uh, infra uh, shipping projects, they have taken up uh, a major uh, priority area in shipping. And uh, they say that the hard infrastructure of ports will need to incorporate automation, robotics, analytics-inspired optimizations to match the ever-rising technological savvy of supply chain players. So they identified specific ports where they would like to finance under AID. Definitely. There's one port that they have taken up in Oman uh, for uh, infrastructure 3.0 upgradation. Yeah. Next set of questions, uh, Mr. Mohan Menon first, then Sir you, and then Mr. Bar. My, so we, we won't be able to hear you from there. Yeah. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to say that a very enlightening presentation on a complex proposition. Uh, my question is twofold. You see, on the one hand, China is um, sort of financing the CPEC and the BRI in a huge manner with its own resources. And concurrently, it is underutilizing this bank we are talking about over here. Is it due to a fear of uh, foreign debt destabilizing internal finances? That could be one aspect. Second, or is it a, a very non-visible strategic ploy for future uh, from which India may uh, sort of learn some derivatives? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, you yeah. wanted to say something? Uh, my question is just I want to boil it down to some specific. Will the infrastructure, Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank be inclined to support projects in Arunachal Pradesh? Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll pose. I don't think we'll be posing projects in Arunachal Pradesh. <laughs> Sir, you wanted to say something? Uh, Here, please. Here, yes. Please. Mr. Baru. Sir. Sir. I was struck. I was struck uh, Is it working? I was struck by Kundu's remark. And they 
दूसरा मैक दीजिए प्लीज Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I was struck by Dr. Kundu's remark about uh, his student being at the senior official of the AIIB. Uh, presumably, he studied in India and then joined the AIIB. So my question to you, uh, Srinivas, yes. you see, you you've been speaking about um, the f what the bank does, the financing uh, of projects, but the World Bank has also been an institution of ideas. and one of the distinguishing features of the world bank and the imf is that almost everybody there has got an american phd yes you know, i mean the way in which they have done recruitment is that the entire policy staff has to do a phd in one american university or the other yes and so they have acquired a certain influence or policy across the world uh, through that recruitment process does aib have any such uh, um policy about recruiting from certain kinds of institutions or uh, do you know phd's from jnu like me have a chance nay <laughs> <laughs> at 65 you have no chance <laughs> at <laughs> 65 you have no chance but uh, i'll respond to all three sir uh, well the first one is the bretton woods institutions how do they compare with the aib i think there's no comparison at all the international monetary fund and the world bank driven by their ideals of multilateralism and economic uh, liberalization with a plethora of staff coming from ivy league institutions are far superior to the intellectual firepower that the aib currently carries and uh, on this there is simply no doubt the aib was struggling to recruit staff and they were paying higher wages than what even bretton woods were paying in spite of the uh, cost of living in uh, beijing being much lesser and uh, so uh, as you can see there are a whole host of opportunities in fact when i spoke to mr pandian the first thing he asked me was are you interested in coming and working for us <laughs> so that, that that is i said i was happy with the ias and i was doing a paper for uh, mr raghavan in uh, the sapru house which was coming up uh, but but uh, the aib is desperately looking for staff who will come and live in china and work Work there, so apparently, uh, and it's a, still a very, very thin, lean institution. Where, uh, in fact, they said they were quite overstretched to monitor more than 50 projects at this point of time, unless they recruit more individuals to handle projects. They don't have uh, any country-based offices. They left it to the various countries to look at. They do not have uh, a, a residing board, as uh, in the case of the World Bank or the IMF. So it's very, very lean. Nascent stages, perhaps in the coming years, it will stabilize more. Uh, sir, with regard to foreign debt sustainability and uh, exchange rate vulnerability, this I would like to respond in that that uh, the AIB has brought out an Asia Infrastructure Financing Report, and they have identified countries where they would like to finance and where they would not like to finance. The countries where they have said uh, our concerns are Turkey, Pakistan. and uh, there's one more russia. russia 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 where they feel that the exchange rate uh, risks are very high also the macroeconomic shocks are very high and as rightly identified in their report in early 2019 pakistan has approached the imf for a 6 billion dollar bailout at this point of time so uh, in other countries of asia they feel that uh, there is uh, uh, a possibility for their loans being secure and infrastructure uh, investment outlook is quite positive so they're going in uh, for sanctioning these and as can be seen they only sanctioned two projects in uh, pakistan uh, through the aib route the bri network is much stronger and higher uh, almost 15 billion dollars as compared 19. to a few 100 million dollars here so uh, their their uh, reports and understanding of foreign exchange risks is quite high then arunachal pradesh will not be unless we pose a project it cannot be considered by an international bank so it is it will not be posed i don't think india will pose a project in uh, arunachal pradesh for financing through aib they had done in the case of adb yeah adb yeah. was different adb there was also some kind there of opposition from china but mm. that but the funding came subsequent mm. but this one we it is very unlikely we pose a project so far we have not posed any projects right any more questions 
Yeah, so there's so Ambassador many. Raghavan first and then the next question yes. there and the yes. third the lady. Yes. And we wind up there. Yes, yes, yes please. I, I have a comment more than a question because thank you very much, Srinivas, for an excellent paper. Thank you, Dr. Kundu, for a very, very good presentation and also Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. But just to marry what uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar said to your presentation, it does appear that the Chinese are also very good students of history. Yes. Because much like the Americans who, who had, along with the setting up of the Bretton Woods institutions, they kept the Marshall Plan out of the Bretton Woods uh, system. Yes. So the bilateral, the bilateral arm of uh, their assistance programs was always very strong. Yes. Uh, and possibly the Chinese are trying to build up a similar portfolio of both bilateral and multilateral uh, instruments at their, uh, at their disposal. Yes. Uh, this is something which is quite striking, really. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. The second question, the gentleman there. Yeah, I'd like to know how contemporary events uh, will affect the AIIB. Does the US-China global tariff war, will it have any impact on the AIIB? And if so, what, it, what will be the fallout? Yes, we'll respond to that. And the here, here, Karen Puriji. Is that Diji? Samin. Mike, my goodness. Uh, what is the governance model for uh, approving the project for meeting the objectives of sustainable economic development goals? And secondly, what is uh, what has been uh, done by them to maintain the balance between sovereign-backed financing and non-sovereign-backed financing? Yes. Okay. So, would you like to say something? Hmm. Mr. Haldia has been the infrastructure genius of India for <laughs> decades. <laughs> so, uh, no, just to uh, reiterate that my question essentially was that uh, what kind of, how would you, do you want to see AIIB do things any differently? Is there, a, are there any gaps in your view or any rectifications that they need to do in what they are doing? Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, I will finish there because yes. I think time is running out yes, now at sir. this point. I need to give him. Okay, I'll give you one question in the end. Uh, as a corollary, take, take, take uh, that also corollary to Arunachal Pradesh, what if Pakistan asks for a project in POK? How would China respond? How okay. India would respond is pretty well known. Yeah. So I'll take up, yeah, uh, take up all these, the questions. Each of these. Up, yeah. uh, firstly, Mr. Raghavan's uh, proposition that. Uh, the bilateral financing, they're keeping it quite separate from multilateral financing. The bilateral financing is not very transparent, it is very aggressive, and uh, it is not looking at debt sustainability. Only now, uh, once defaults are coming in, are countries talking about uh, debt sustainability frameworks in bilateral financing. But multilateral financing on the Chinese network is far more cautious, and the scale of financing is also quite limited. Uh, in terms of uh, the gaps in AIB financing, sir, the gaps in AIB currently are their sheer inadequate manpower. They do not have manpower to supervise. There's not enough soldiers on the ground. In that, that they're not monitoring projects. It is entirely left to the country authorities to monitor. Also, uh, in terms of implementation, procurement, uh, compliance of uh, their conditionalities. One thing that comes across is the Bretton Woods institutions are ruthless conditionality setters and uh, their monitoring is very, very rigorous. We have a country director who sits in Delhi who monitors and reviews projects regularly. However, the AIB has no such uh, uh, feet on the ground, soldiers on the ground. They are monitoring from Beijing projects being implemented across the world. And it's going to be increasingly dif difficult once they start financing projects in Africa, Latin America, where memberships have come and where projects would be posed. In terms of the governance model and how sovereign and non-sovereign financing would take place, it has been the objective of all the multilateral banks, be it the World Bank, the ADB or the AIB, that we will mobilize private financing. And private financing could be through uh, 
sovereign back financing or non-sovereign guarantees which are provided. There are subnational governments which are providing guarantees. Uh, what I found in the case of the AIB financing was it was quite focused in terms of uh, the agencies to whom they would lend to. And, uh, but they've had uh, trouble in getting projects which, where they have lent to subnational government started. And that was what the Indonesian project showed. It has been almost two and a half years where the project has not commenced because the subnational governments are struggling to identify the procurement uh, procedures as also the selection of contractors as per their guidelines. And trade war. Well, you see, the trade war is quite a complex uh, manner in which it, one can look at. Having been a staffer at the IMF, my view is that the Chinese are not really looking to protect the renminbi anymore. They would like the renminbi. In fact, the renminbi has to appreciate, and you would see that the RMB has appreciated over a period of time. And uh, it's not the mid-90s when they used to uh, adjust the RMB plus minus 0.3 percent every day and uh, those years are no longer there. They would like the RMB to appreciate so that, uh, so that their products are more and more competitive and uh, it, over a period of time it has been seen that the spillover effects of China's uh, impact in case the RMB is not properly uh, valued against the global currency is quite high. And as of now, there is no impact of the trade war on uh, Chinese uh, exports. That said, the way in which it is escalating uh, with uh, multiple tariffs and other firewalls being put up on both sides, it, it could be uh, that uh, the export competitiveness of China will be severely hit. And once uh, that happens, then this kind of surpluses that they have in their economy to finance various international infrastructure projects may be coming down. Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal Pradesh, sir. <laughs> Oh, P.O.K. Oh, sorry, P.O.K. China. China. China uh, well, my nominating as, I, as I already said, sir, a project would be brought to the board only if there is consensus amongst its key uh, key stakeholders. And I would like to point out uh, that uh, uh, in my interactions with Dr. M. Narsimham, India's 1981 program was not brought to the board because the United States felt that we would use the money to buy uh, MiG aircraft. You know? the, so it was felt that you were buying aircraft from the French and the French were pushing that project. So the Americans and, and a great deal of consensus had to be worked out that it was for balance of payments crisis. So uh, projects which are controversial in nature are unlikely to be placed for board consideration, let alone approval. And, 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 uh, and as I said, the, the board, the AIB board has made decisions on consensus. There is no uh, voting decision that I have seen on, this, on these projects. They're all consensus-based decisions, as with the World Bank and with the... So a member can abstain, but uh, you don't vote against. That's been the practice. Yeah, um, now since we are running short of time, may I request uh, Professor Kundu, in case he has got any observations, he may like to say so. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This question was raised by many. I thought I'll just provide the information. During course of two and a half months of interaction with the AIIB officials and our officials, including the research partners, one thing was made very clear to them that one belt, one road discussion would, should not take place. But despite that, in eight meetings, two of them, they did present that. I think since I was handling this, instead of raising a political issue, we simply ignored that and we continued the discussion and we conveyed it very clearly that this is not part of uh, our framework of negotiation. But nonetheless, one of the vice presidents, I forget the name, was specifically asked this question that would you fund a project in Arunachal Pradesh? He thought for a while and he said, yes, we would provided it is bankable. So basically they would say, well, because of the political uncertainties, it is not bankable. So they would take that route of escape. You know, by, uh, I entirely agree with Mr. Srinivasan that uh, the time has been reduced and there is some competition which has come up. Uh, yeah. ADB is coming up. Japan wants to uh, increase its presence and uh, certainly Afro uh, Indian Asian corridor. I mean, there I think AIIB's role is being seen as an important one. But you know, our question is that as far as overall infrastructure funding is concerned, there is some deficit, as I said, 10 to 15 percent. 
but more important is that the regional priorities would that be addressed and obviously when we said that they are these are our regional priorities and also upgradation of the infrastructure where cost recovery would be difficult the answer that came from them is that well you have to make them bankable they are not here for regional development they are here for banking purposes so that is what uh, has brought to the forefront so we have to see to it that how some of these uh, projects which have problems of bankability how the state can come in and support and then get the finances from AIIB or the institution thank you anything dr sanjeev yeah before i wind up yeah thank you just a, a one observation i would like to say uh, there were uh, there was question about uh, aiib and uh, bri i think the major difference is that aiib is a multilateral institution while bri is not a multilateral institution and therefore uh, when china uh, negotiates the loan uh, rates of loan it will be different for pakistan it will be different for kazakhstan or any other country because there is no set global standard as far as bri is concerned china deals with each country at bilateral level although uh, they meet at forum and all but uh, projects are all bilateral thank you all right that brings me to i may extend by 2 minutes <laughs> uh, i have seven points i think i'll try and cover in 2 minutes one is the Oh, there's a question which is asked, why AIB? Why AIB is a very clear thing, because China and some other countries have always been trying to bring in some reforms in the World Bank, IMF, etc. That was frustrated over a period of time. There's an alternative that has been created for that particular system. The second is the coordination and competition between India and China. We always, whenever, whenever in many forums when we discuss India-China relations, mainly the competition comes into play. This is one of the places where the cooperation has come into play. So there are issues like this probably we need to look at you know, to work across the, the India-China relationship. The third point is on the Northeast India. Not only AIB, many people wanted to come and do projects in Northeast India. Japan tried to do that and other countries tried to do that. The problem that we find in Northeast India is, firstly, we, we, in, in a forum like this, generally we treat Northeast India as a one entity. If you, if you have served, I mean, I served long enough in Northeast India to realize this. In, I have served in all the six states of the Northeast. They have different, different, I would say, entity, a different way of working, different way of doing things. So if we don't understand the, understand the complications of Northeast India, we are not going to make headway there. So we need to work around this, and that is a requirement that has to be done by us. It is, nobody else can do it for us. We have to do this. And the third thing is on the... Uh, AIB versus ADB, etc. The, the way AIB is functioning is creating some kind of a competition in banking, in lending, etc., etc. This is a thing which is a positive phenomena that has come in because of the AIB. The, um, also, we need to be aware of how Chinese compartmentalize politics, diplomacy, economy, etc. The politics may be communism, but the economy will be doing capitalism. So this kind of compartmentalization, the way they deal with things differently, need to be understood by us. And um, uh, lastly, the um, OBOR and AIB projects, the questions were coming up. Please understand the points are already raised by the panelists very well. That OBOR, it, though it has been projected as a multilateral kind of an uh, initiative, however, the dealings have been very bilateral. There have been no multilateral projects that have been coming into into one belt one road. That has been a major so far. so far, major concern. After the second BRF, there has been some kind of an adjustment that are seen in in the way Mr. Xi Jinping made that statement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also that has been created because of the pressure that they were facing by the countries that are pushing back on many of the projects. So it was an adjustment that need to take place at that point in time. So the issue that comes up is suppose if an AIB approve certain projects in one belt, one road, because of the strict condition that they have on multilateralism, on, on transparency, on, on bankability, on sovereign uh, guarantee, etc., it will also lend some amount of legitimacy to the one belt, one road initiative. 
So this is something that we need to keep in mind. I'll stop here. I must thank Mr. Sinivas for an excellent presentation. I must thank Professor Kundu for having uh, given his very incisive remarks and also to Dr. Sanjeev and lastly to ICWA for hosting this sir, event. Thank you very much. Give me 30 seconds for both of time. On behalf of Indian Council of World Affairs, I extend my senior, sincere thanks to Sri V. Srinivas for presenting an excellent paper, Lieutenant General S.L. Narasimhan for chairing the session and making the important remarks, Professor Amitab Kundu for valuable remarks and observations. I also like to thank each one of you for your time and participation. We had a wonderful event. Please join us for refreshment in the fire. Thank you.